Good afternoon and good morning to our West Coast uh, presenters and attendees. Um, everyone is on mute today, so feel free to use the chat box for any questions or comments. Today we're joined by experts from the National Centers, Richard Gonzalez, from the Administration for Children and Families, Karen Ruprecht from the State Capacity Building Center, Jim Lesko from Atlas Research, Prite Washington from the National Center on After School and Summer Enrichment, Jennifer Drake from the National Center on Parent, Family, and Community Engagement, and I'm Evelyn Keating from the State Capacity Building Center. We'd like to know a little bit about who's on our webinar today. So Violetta is going to post a poll, and we'd ask you to choose your position or role that best fits where you are today. And if you don't see your position listed, feel free to use the chat box below. We'll take an, a minute to do this. Looks like we have a lot of state government professionals. Some training and technical assistance professionals. DCRNR. Folks from PDG grantees. University staff. and a couple of direct serving practitioners. So thank you for sharing with us where you are today. Thank you, Violetta. Today we're going to explore resources from childcare.gov, from the preschool development grants, school age childcare, family and community engagement, and some other national resources. So without further ado, we're going to turn this over to Karen Ruprecht. Great. Thanks, Evelyn. And good afternoon again, everyone. I'm Karen Ruprecht with the State Capacity Building Center. And as Evelyn mentioned, I am going to show you and talk through a little bit of an overview of childcare.gov and take you through some screenshots so you can actually see the site if you're not already familiar with it. And I encourage you to explore the site on your own um, after this call or um, even if you want to kind of move along in the website with me. Um, and we hope you can learn um, how you can use this information um, from childcare.gov in your own work. So with that, let's um, get started. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about childcare.gov in case you're not familiar with it. Um, as some of you may know, childcare.gov is a national consumer education website that was created with ECDF reauthorization. It's the federal website with the .gov portion um, of, the, of the website address, and it's operated by the Office of Child Care. The Office of Child Care contracts with the State Capacity Building Center, where Evelyn and I work, um, and the State Capacity Building Center provides quality assurance and conducts maintenance on the site. So originally, the approach to the website was that childcare.gov would directly interface with state databases, the state and territory databases, to gather information to populate a national child care search. But due to many factors, it was decided that rather than interface with all of these different individual databases, childcare.gov would provide families with an array of connections to important child care, early childhood, and family support information by providing links to these state and local websites. So this allows childcare.gov to really be that one-stop shop for finding resources that are closest to the family and that are really the most relevant to them in their states and territories. This approach, by linking out to these different state sites, also leverages the great work that many of you are doing right now on your consumer education website. 
So um, as the slide shows you, the target audience for childcare.gov is family. And the links that are used on the site go to the most family-friendly information that each state and territory has available. In addition to the links to state-specific information, the childcare.gov site also includes, as I mentioned before, some general information about childcare, child development and health, and financial assistance, including paying for childcare. Um, just to give you a couple other key points about the website, it is 508 compliant and it is fully translated into Spanish. And I want to spend just a couple of moments um, telling you a little bit about the quality assurance process that we conduct on this site because it is pretty extensive and I think it's really important to understand um, kind of the depth and the breadth of the information on this site. So the State Capacity Building Center childcare.gov maintenance team um, performs regular quality assurance on all the more than 2,000 links on this site. So um, as you can see just from that number, there's quite a few links that are on childcare.gov. This process ensures that the links posted on the site are the most appropriate, family-friendly state links available. Uh, we've established a fairly robust quality assurance protocol, and I won't go into a, a lot of depth and detail about that, but we're more than happy to talk offline about that. Um, but just a couple of key points that um, we work directly with the state and territory leadership to identify the websites to put on childcare.gov that might be helpful for families across that wide variety of topics that I just shared with you. Um, we check monthly for broken links um, because when you have 2,000 links on a website, um, inevitably something um, might not actually work um, from month to month. Um, but we do these um, monthly broken link checks to quickly identify and replace any of those broken links. So families aren't directed to a site um, and there's nothing there for them. Uh, there's a few key principles that we really think about to determine what state pages um, to link to. So first of all, and this goes back to this first tenet on this slide, is are the web pages written with a family audience in mind? And we all know that's not always possible for each link used on the site, but it really is the first consideration when selecting any state link. Second, we look to see if the page that, uh, that the link leads to is user-friendly and in plain language. We don't want to send families or a user to a state site that has a lot of regulatory and legal type of language if there's other more appropriate uh, sites available that are user-friendly and in plain language. Third, we look to see is the link that is used the most direct. So when a user or family goes to the site, are they led directly to that site or do they have to continue to, to click through and find the information that they need? We all know how how um, frustrating it can be to have to click through many things just to get to the information that you need. So we try to provide that most direct link. And finally, are the links used in childcare.gov the most important and relevant, um, depending on what that topic is? So during the 2A process, the quality assurance process, we're communicating with the state and territory leadership to make sure that we're including the best links on the childcare.gov site. So, um, I'm going to show you some of the screenshots to show you the family friendliness of the site and give you an idea of the kind of information that's on childcare.gov. So you'll notice on the top of this page, the Learn More page, throughout the site there are indicators to help families find different sections within the site. So you notice the green underline of the Learn More. This lets users know um, that is the page they're on. And I also want to draw attention to the childcare.gov logo. Users can click on this to navigate right back to the home page um, to search for other information or state-specific information. If you scroll down on the Learn page, uh, you'll see different tiles that direct families to different content areas within this section. So the Learn More tiles uh, cover areas around childcare options, ensuring safe and healthy childcare, choosing quality childcare, paying for childcare, other support and resources for your family and your child's health and development. So if we click on the child care options tile, we would be directed um, to this page. And you'll notice on the left-hand side, it's circled, um, there's a drop-down menu of each of the content areas and some introductory text that's on this home page. So on this page, I'm not going to read it to you, but there's some text for child care options. So it discusses child care resource and referral agencies and child care licensing and subsidy agencies as additional good sources of information. 
So as you look at the menu on the left that's circled, you'll notice that each section toggles down. So um, if you um, opened up one of those sections, like ensuring safe and healthy childcare, there's even more content for families to explore there as well. One thing that I do uh, want to talk a little bit more about is the fact that uh, quality is reinforced throughout these Learn More pages. So in addition um, to linking families to state-level information, childcare.gov also helps parents understand what can sometimes be a confusing and cluttered childcare landscape and the importance of selecting a high-quality program. You'll notice that throughout the pages, and this is an example from the Get Help Paying for Child Care page, um, information about the importance of a high-quality child care program is reinforced. So just kind of briefly in this text, it talks about the fact that high-quality programs may cost more than other options, but when children are in a quality program, they're able to develop, explore, and grow. It also goes on to talk about um, to help families um, connect to the, um, their provider to make sure they're meeting health and safety requirements, such as licensing. And then you can see here that families are encouraged to view past inspection reports, and that link takes directly to the state licensing and the inspection reports page. Um, so they can view those pages if that's what they're interested in doing. So now I want to take um, you through a kind of a, a quick tour of some of these state pages. So uh, we talked a little bit about the learn more information. And back on the home page, um, families are able to search for state-specific information. So on this page, um, you can see that I pulled up or I typed in Georgia. There's a drop-down box where families can just kind of click on um, where they want to go. If they uh, click on Find Child Care Now in Georgia, Georgia, they're taken directly to Georgia's child care search page. Um, you can also click on Get Child Care Resources to Georgia. And if I clicked on that, I would be taken um, to this page. Um, and uh, it's this, from this page, you're directed to a menu of four main categories. Um, understanding and finally finding child care, financial assistance for families, health and social services, and child development and early learning. And this page here displayed for you is uh, understanding and finding child care. And you can see there's different um, headers here. Um, families, again, can search for child care in Georgia. They can look at child care licensing and regulations. Uh, there's even a section for school age care for the After School um, Association in Georgia and information on choosing quality child care for your children, inspection reports, and criminal background checks. As you look through the site, and as you look perhaps to your own state or territory page, you'll notice that states may have a different number of links. For example, there might be some more information under choosing quality child care for your children for some states or territories than there are for others. Um, if a state doesn't have a link available, um, for example, if a state does not have a quality rating improvement system, um, there's not a link for that. So we don't um, put in links unless there's active information for parents to search. So um, in closing for childcare.gov, I just want to draw attention to three main benefits of the site that I want you all to think about and consider as you're working on providing information for families um, and stakeholders within your state and territory. Uh, Childcare.gov is really just one-stop site. Um, it does help organize state resources for families in one place. So it's a great thing if you want to link to it um, on your own website or use the information um, for families in your state and territory. Um, it does provide um, a variety of useful information around lots of topics, not just searching for child care, um, and also different resources to help families. And I think what's most important, too, here is that state and territories can actually use the language on the childcare.gov site. Um, on your own website or in your materials. So sometimes, you know, we're thinking about how do I really talk about what is quality child care or how do I talk about um, how to get help paying for child care. You can go to this website and use the information on this website to use um, for your own purposes. So I hope this gives you um, a brief overview of childcare.gov. Again, I encourage you to um, go to childcare.gov and look for it on your own and look for your own state. Um, and if you do have any questions, I encourage you to use the chat box and type in your questions and we'll attempt to answer them um, either at the end of this um, webinar or in our Ask Me Anything webinar in a couple of weeks. 
So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Richard Gonzalez with the Administration for Children and Families, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about the Preschool Development Grant. Richard? Hello, everybody. Um, so um, uh, thank you so much for allowing me to speak a little bit about this grant. Uh, what I'm going to do is just we'll have us uh, move to the next slide and um, talk to you about the purposes of the Preschool Development Grant Birth to Five. Now, I'm not sure how many of you know about this. I'm hoping everybody on the call knows about this, but this was something that was funded through Congress for one year. We, we just awarded uh, 44 states, District of Columbia and the, uh, and the Virgin Islands, a grant uh, in December of 2018 for one year. And it basically has four main purposes. It's all about systems development and really focusing on all of the services and, and, and programs within a state um, for through, through the age of five. And you can see here on this slide the four main purposes of the initiative. The idea here is to give the states an opportunity to conduct a thorough statewide birth through five needs assessment. And the idea here is really a state could choose to assess anything that has to do with early childhood, whether it's programs or the support services that go along with it. And then to develop, based on what they learn from that needs assessment, to develop a strategic plan uh, that would guide the vision or the direction for the state to go into in future years. Uh, a second purpose had to do with really encouraging the partnerships among all the various stakeholders and early childhood programs and service partners within the state. So anybody working to support families and children would become part of this statewide partnership effort, and the whole idea is to improve the coordination, the collaboration, the integration, and basically come up with a more efficient use of the resources um, as things cost more and, and, and services get harder to provide. The third issue has to do with maximizing parental choice and knowledge, and basically increasing parent engagement, meaningful parent engagement within the state, but also expanding parent knowledge about existing programs and services so that the parents could, in effect, have the types of knowledge they need to make wiser choices about the programs and services they want or need for their children. And the fourth overall purpose has to do with the, gen the kind of general guide of all this to enhance overall school readiness and to transition children more effectively for, for at any point in time in their, in, in their development. So not just transition from pre-K or, or child care or Head Start into, into kindergarten, but transition as an infant into a toddler program from home visiting into child care or Head Start, or early Head Start, et cetera. So the idea is how do we look at all those transition points and make the transitions? How do we share best practices among the staff in all those different programs so that they can share resources and become more aware of uh, what, what they have learned across the different programs and services? So what does this have to do with the topic that we're talking about, consumer education? Well, one of the things in focusing on this maximizing parental engagement and expanding parent knowledge, the idea here was a real emphasis on making sure that states look at what they already have in place in their states and trying to link to it or expand upon it. Now, when Congress appropriated funds for us, they instructed HHS and Ed, they instructed Health and Human Services and the Department of Education not to really uh, provide, a, make a lot of requirements on the part of the state, but to allow state flexibility as much as possible so that states could build on where they are in their development of services and, 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 and resources. So in our language, when we put out the notice for funding, we very specifically said in when a state considers how it wants to spend its funds, how it wants to allocate its funds, that the states were encouraged we, since we couldn't require them, we encourage them to include the related activities required by the Child Care Development Block Grant reauthorization, and that included such things as building a better consumer information system and supporting parents in those decisions with consideration to linking or taking advantage of the new National Child Care Development Block Grant website, childcare.gov. So here we see the linkage where we're saying the states you don't have to create a new thing here. You already have a requirement within your CCDBG requirements, and maybe you can use some of these funds to enhance or build upon that. 
we also recognize that states may be developing other pieces that may not be directly linked right away, but could become linked at a later stage. So what I want to do is that that's really all I wanted to give you a sense of the overall purpose of this initiative. And I am now going to pass this over to Jim Lesko, who is going to speak to you a little bit more about PDG Birth to Five, specifically around our third activity, which has to do with maximizing parental choice and knowledge. So Jim, if you're there or I'm Not? here. I'm just um, looking for uh, the maybe. remainder of the slides. And uh, maybe they're not there. <laughs> they don't appear to be. Okay. Um, well. So uh, hold on one second. I can at least pull mine up, and uh, I'll talk to them until um, they arrive. Okay, so uh, I am going to speak uh, to the concept of um, parent um, uh, activity three around parent education for PDG uh, birth to five. Let me see. I see they're being paged through, so um, I'm going to move on to my own PowerPoint, and when somebody just give me a heads up when you get there. So um, as Richard mentioned, um, activity three, uh, one of the expectations for the states, uh, the grantees, recipients, is to maximize parental choice and knowledge about the state's mixed delivery system of existing programs and providers. A predominant strategy that states uh, have employed to share that, uh, at least the knowledge portion of that information with parents, has been uh, through um, social media and websites being um, a critical component um, of that uh, experience for parents. And so uh, we have, uh, as Richard mentioned, um, 45 states in one territory currently working uh, through this content uh, with states. And uh, we had an opportunity to do uh, a, a broad view perspective on uh, what the PDG B to 5 state websites look like. And uh, there were six consistent themes uh, that we identified uh, which were very consistent uh, with what Karen uh, shared uh, on the uh, childcare.gov. Um, and so I think, first of all, we're starting to see uh, some uh, strong consistency between what's being recommended by the Office of Child Care and the childcare.gov uh, expectations around websites for states and a, and a direct link um, between what the PDG states um, are creating and are enhancing um, and or collaborating with uh, their existing uh, child care uh, state administrative offices and their websites. Um, you know, our, our emphasis, of course, um, as Richard mentioned, too, is to uh, not encourage states to duplicate the effort um, within, uh, within their own um, uh, uh, website designs to have uh, separate parent portals, but, uh, but instead to have uh, one dominating um, uh, portal per state where parents can go to access the information that they need. So the six sites, I mean, the six consistent themes uh, that we've, we've identified and we're seeing uh, within, within the PDG state websites are, one, um, direct linkages uh, to child care information um, and the linkages to those uh, sites within their state. So these are state-specific uh, information and linkages. And this, again, directly relates to uh, what Karen mentioned before. So we're glad to see, happy to see that states um, have embraced that concept. Uh, the second uh, theme is around child development, knowledge, and information. So we have seen a consistent number of states um, during, uh, provide linkages to child development information. So uh, these would be ages and stages of skills uh, that they would expect their children to be able to um, uh, see, uh, as well as for parents um, and respected caregivers to support parent, uh, to support children's development um, along those lines. As well as uh, a number of sites also have some very helpful calendars and uh, daily activities uh, for parents and caregivers uh, to, to use to interact with their children uh, to, to continue to support that development effort. Uh, the third theme um, is information for, uh, around financial um, assistance. And so we are seeing um, a number of states, ah, there it is, 
um, a number of states um, with uh, linkages for families um, who continue to need uh, financial assistance to support um, whatever uh, sorts of care that they need for their children. Uh, and so this is a great central site, um, and we're happy to see that happening. Uh, a new piece of information, at least uh, uh, for us on the part of the PDG side, um, has been, uh, and happily uh, to see, uh, linkages to um, early signs uh, and screening um, uh, supports for children. Uh, this is, uh, you know, has been in increasing in interest um, among many states, and fortunately amongst um, uh, both pediatricians and family physicians as well, uh, to uh, more closely um, uh, pay attention to the development and to identifying children earlier. Uh, we have quite a number of states now um, who are using ages and stages uh, through a variety of uh, means within their states, um, state websites, local websites, uh, pediatric uh, websites, uh, so that we're seeing a strong emphasis um, on child find, actually, is the terminology that the, uh, the world uh, uses as well. So that's great to see um, states making that available. We also um, have seen a significant number of states offer advocacy. Um, as, a, as a linkage, so more information around uh, the information that parents need so that they're able to access the services uh, that they require for themselves or their children. And then, um, interestingly enough, on a significant number of parent sites um, is uh, also linkages uh, to practitioner resources um, and professional development. So I'm going to give you uh, whoops, a couple uh, state examples just to reference, and I know some of these slides um, are difficult to see. Um, but the first two examples um, I will uh, mention um, uh, do uh, follow um, the uh, child care um, expectations that Karen referenced earlier. And this is from uh, the state of Delaware. Uh, a, a nice um, highlight uh, for them is that they have uh, several direct links for families. Um, in the purple on the left, um, in the green in the middle is linkages for families around resources to support them. Um, and then um, the blue to the, to the right um, is that, I, as I mentioned, several states have direct linkages for their practitioners on their parent page. The next um, example that I've provided uh, for you is from the state of Pennsylvania, another PDG state. Um, and they have a significant focus um, around parent information on their site. And so, um, it's very family-oriented, uh, looking at their um, open-facing page. You'll see um, many links oriented towards parenting um, and assisting with them, so watching them grow around uh, children's development, um, helping them learn, giving activities um, that parents and caregivers can use, uh, caring for their children, uh, sites related to care and health, um, and then a little bit of advice um, and financial assistance. One of the things I did want to identify for you is in the upper uh, sort of right-hand corner, which I think is a, is a great resource on the Pennsylvania page, is um, the opportunity to um, have the information on that state page translated into uh, Chinese, English, Russian, and Spanish. It's a great resource, I think. Um, the fourth, uh, I mean, the third example I have um, which uh, diverges from uh, currently uh, the direct linkage to uh, Karen's emphasis on childcare.gov and, and the requirements. This is from the state of New York. Um, and rather than this just being uh, a parent page, this is their human resource page. So um, uh, uh, it, they embrace uh, parent information and connections uh, within this page. Uh, it, it does require parents to do a bit more na uh, navigation at this point. but. We'll, um, We've had some conversations with the state um, around this. Um, and my final um, uh, mention is I did uh, say that I wanted to highlight this. Uh, this is from the state of Kansas. Now, this is not their parent direct site. But I think this is a reflection of a very interesting way um, that the state of Kansas has also uh, worked to, tell, to get the stories uh, from families. And, um, this is uh, an opportunity for families to tell their stories about their resiliency. Um, so it's very similar to a storytelling project, um, and families get to go onto this page um, and tell their stories about their struggles and their successes that they've made uh, to better support their children um, and their families' work. Um, I, I think it's worth uh, 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 an opportunity for you all to take a look at that uh, if you have a chance.
finally, um, I uh, did list um, so a couple of the states um, that I've highlighted um, on this uh, slide presentation, Pennsylvania, Delaware, New York, and Kansas. Um, you have those direct links. Um, and I also wanted, you know, or suggested that people um, from the PDG states may want to take a look at uh, Florida and Virginia um, as additional examples um, of um, also PDG states that have also embraced the concept uh, of the uh, childcare.gov site. Um, so as Karen mentioned too, um, if there are questions, um, can um, please feel free to put them in the chat box um, and we'll be happy uh, to get back to you. And now um, it's my pleasure uh, to turn this over to um, Ms. Washington um, and the NKS group. To, um, so here you go. you may be on Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Can you can hear, hear me you. now? Thank you. Yes. Awesome. I've just been chatting away. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll start over. Hi, everybody. Um, as I actually said before, it's really great to be with you today. Um, and these have been some wonderful resources. And so as a member of the National Center on After School and Summer Enrichment, I'm really happy to talk about consumer education and engagement as it relates to the needs of school-aged children and families as they make the choices for child care. We've heard some really wonderful information today about early childhood, and often when we talk about the topics, these topics related to child care, our focus is on infants, toddlers, and preschoolers, as it should be. But we also know that many households consist of both young and older children, and that almost half of the children that are served through CCDF subsidies our school age, which is shown on this national data profile. And so it's important to keep this group in mind when considering what information to include on your website. And moreover, we're vastly approaching the end of the school year, and summer is a critical time for school age care. And many child care centers and family child care homes offer extended hours, so six to six or maybe um, 24 hours. And while this really helps to meet the needs for younger children, as school ends, we know that families all over the country are deciding on options for their school-aged children. And I can speak from personal experience because while I'm with you, I have a 10-year-old and a 13-year-old at home and camp hasn't started yet. And so I am sure that they have just finished playing Minecraft or Fortnite and they're probably trying to earn money to go to the neighborhood carnival a little later. Now, while most of our in-case products are designed for CCDF lead agencies and our colleagues at the state level, we do have some that are intended for families and providers and our child care resource and referral partners who support them. You may be familiar with the School Age Consumer Education Toolkit, which is on your screen. It was designed to inform CCRNRs and providers about key areas that are identified in the CCBBG reauthorization and the CCDF final rule around information to provide families to support them in making informed decisions about child care. The toolkit was recently updated uh, with a new section called Spotlight on Summer, and you can see that indicated in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Now the spotlight on summer portion provides information that really makes the case for the importance of quality childcare for school-aged children during the summer months. 
we know that access to programs is really important in combating what's called the summer slide. And this is a term that's used to denote how children without access to quality programs have a hard time retaining what they've learned during the year. And this places them at a real disadvantage compared to children who do have access to care. And we know that that disparity grows over time. And so as with other sections of the toolkit, CCRNRs and providers and parents will find resources on different areas, including physical health and development, nutrition, social and emotional health, and family engagement. And they can receive information on why these things are actually important and it's important to continue them during the summer months. Here's another tool that really serves providers and families. In case recently released a set of tip sheets for providers and families that include suggestions and resources on how to support children's growth and development during the summer. The summer months are a really wonderful time for families to reconnect without the routine of school. And providers can take advantage of the warmer weather and relaxed schedules to really engage families and introduce fun ways to make sure that children continue to learn. So there are two sets of uh, tip sheets. One is for providers and the other one is for families. And both sets are organized with information on before summer, during the summer months, and the end of summer. So right now we're taking a look at the provider tip sheet. And it includes information on encouraging intentional planning and creating experiences that speak to children's interests and needs and promote a connection with what's happening during the child care program and at home. And this can be new for providers who may not be year-round or who may operate only during the summer months. The tip sheets are also accessible to providers and parents since these are the people obviously who are on the front line to ensure that school-aged children have positive learning experiences during the summer months. Uh, we took effort to make sure that the tip sheets are straightforward, they're actionable, they're practical, and mostly, most importantly, they're research-based. So the before summer section looks at getting ready, getting to know new children and families, what skills to address, what experiences you want them to have. And if it's a year-round program, providers can explore how to make summer a really special time and different from the rest of the year. The during summer portion looks to focus on engaging families and fostering those important relationships. Providers can start implementing plans for summer retention. And there are tips to promote physical activity and nutrition, which are really important. There's a lot of information out there about weight gain during the summer. And finally, the after summer section encourages reflection and celebration. And we're always mindful of transitions. We've heard a lot about transitions. The end of the summer is an important time for families who are staying with a year-round program or if they're heading off and heading back to the school system. Now to further support the home program connection, we have the parent and caregiver tip sheet as a companion to the provider tip sheet. It's really important that parents and caregivers make that connection of what's happening between childcare and in the home so that they're reinforcing and supporting one another. And this continues even into school age. To support this, many of the provider and parent tips that are on the tip sheets intentionally complement one another. You'll see that just as providers are encouraged to connect with parents, we also suggest that parents take that initiative and connect with their child care provider to discuss the same thing. In this way, we're able to support parents having a voice, which we know is important. And looking at before summer, parents can help children get excited about their summer program. And they can help them with that transition from a scheduled school year to a summer schedule. During summer, parents can reinforce what was learned through things like reading routines and also tips. There are tips on daily events that can create opportunities to learn, all while making and having fun and enjoying the summer. And then for after summer, uh, parents can join providers in celebrating summer successes and, and preparing for a new school year. So we think that these resources can be helpful in both informing and engaging parents, as well as supporting them as advocates for their children and staying involved in their growth. And through providing tips, parents can continue to learn what to look for in a program, and this will support 
to making informed childcare decisions. So one final resource that I wanted to share with you today is relevant to providers and CCR and our agencies, but could be important for families also. I mentioned earlier that almost half of the children across the country serve with CCDF subsidies or school age. And we know that that number goes up during the summer with the end of the school year. We found that while year-round providers may be familiar with CCDF as a source to recruit and serve families, some summer programs who serve CCDF eligible families may not be familiar with this resource. So this brief contains questions related to summer programs in CCDF. And it also includes links to relevant resources such as State After School Network, the National After School Association, and information about licensing and summer camps. And that is what I have for you today. I apologize for the audio glitch. I really appreciate the time to share a few resources that we hope will help to educate and inform and engage families. If you have any questions, please do add them in the chat pod. And at this time, I'm going to pass the baton on to my colleague, Jennifer Drake. Thank you again. Thanks, Prete. Uh, I am Jennifer Drake uh, from the National Center on Parent Family Community Engagement. And I'm delighted to be able to share a little bit about NCPFCE's resources on consumer education and consumer and family engagement. We all know that consumer education is part of the CCDBG and CCDF, right? And, and now the PDG Birth to Five as well. The importance of consumer education and engagement is also recognized in the Parent Family Community Engagement Framework for Early Childhood Systems. The PFC Framework for Early Childhood Systems is a visual guide for understanding how early childhood systems components can be aligned to support early childhood programs, providers, and comprehensive community services. Together, these professionals work with parents to promote positive, enduring outcomes for families and children. This is the framework, and it's a little bit hard to see here, and we don't have time to go deep into it today. Please do go to the resource um, to see it in full. But you'll see that equity, inclusiveness, and cultural and linguistic responsiveness in that outer ring are overarching qualities we strive for. The next ring shows system level elements that drive and support the program foundations, impact areas, and child and family outcomes. Notice how consumer education and engagement is situated as a system level element of family engagement. Sharing information and engaging with families as consumers of services is an important essential element of a system to support family engagement. The PFC framework is available in English and Spanish, and there are four accompanying resources in this series designed to support implementation of the PFCE framework. A crosswalk between the CCDF final rule and the framework, a systems assessment workbook, an action and implementation guide, and a collection of sample state scenarios. Because consumer education and consumer engagement is a systems component, each of these resources addresses consumer education and engagement. Let's take a quick look at the assessment workbook. This resource has three parts. Part one offers steps to help you organize a team of partners and prepare for a planning process. Part two is an assessment tool intended to help you gauge the extent to which your system currently promotes parent, family, and community engagement within each of the system components, including consumer education and engagement. Part three is a guide to developing an action plan. And this workbook is designed so that you and your team could choose to begin by using only the consumer education and engagement section if you really wanted to zero in on this topic, and then come back to complete the other sections when you're ready and interested in those components. If you have questions or comments about the PFC framework or would like more information, uh, feel free to share in chat. 
We have another series that might be useful to you, the Foundations for Quality Consumer Education and Engagement series. This series is a collection of resources designed to support states, territories, and tribes and their partners in developing and implementing effective, family-friendly consumer education and engagement strategies. And we'll take a closer look at a few of these. Throughout all our resources, you'll see references to consumer education and consumer engagement. And if you're wondering what we mean by consumer engagement or how it's different from consumer education, you'll find the answers in this resource, the Consumer Engagement Orientation. This resource introduces a vision for engaging families as consumers and explains how this vision relates to consumer education and family engagement. You can use this resource to build a shared understanding of terms and concepts and to make your systems more responsive to parents and families. In short, consumer education tends to focus on one-way sharing of information, providing information to families. Consumer engagement focuses on two-way sharing of information through mutually respectful interactions in which families and early childhood and school age professionals work together to find, share, and use information. And when parents and families are engaged as consumers of early childhood and school age services, they act as decision makers who are equipped with information and seek access to quality early childhood and school age care and education for their children. They're resourceful users of early childhood, school age, and comprehensive services that support child and family well-being throughout early childhood and beyond. They are trusted peers who help their friends and families understand and connect with the highest quality options available. And they're leaders who advance program quality through leadership efforts in their child's program and in their community. As early childhood and school age professionals expand our knowledge and capacities, we can become more effective in inviting and responding to families' interests and values and supporting and partnering with families and other stakeholders. This resource offers tips, strategies, examples, and other resources to support you in operationalizing that vision for consumer engagement. It includes an overview of consumer engagement, three keys to effective consumer engagement, and eight strategies that may be used to engage families as consumers and to better understand their interests and needs. You may find these strategies useful for engaging parents as consumers in plans and processes and programs that are part of an agency's everyday responsibilities. Um, for example, consumer education, subsidy administration, QRIS, and other general efforts to improve quality and access to services. A guide to creating a family-friendly experience offers research-based information that agencies and organizations can use uh, to create or enhance a family-friendly consumer education website. If you're responsible for developing and posting content yourself or supporting staff who do, you can directly apply this information to your work. If your website is managed by others or if you work with a vendor to develop and post content, you can apply this information to your plans and requests and quality improvement efforts. This guide offers tips for plain language, reading levels, layout, and promoting consumer engagement, and more. Um, along with the tips and resources referenced throughout this guide, this resource includes an assessment tool you can use to evaluate the family friendliness of your consumer education website. And we encourage you to use the guide and the assessment tool together. Often, when we're talking about consumer education websites, questions come up about how to get families to your website. And one way is through social media. Social media can also be a powerful tool for consumer engagement. This guide covers everything from developing and managing a social media plan, identifying audiences, and connecting your social media efforts to your mission, choosing the best sites and times to post um, based on your audiences and objectives, considering technical requirements, promotion, quality assurance, 
um, creating posts that are strengths-based and easy for readers to understand, that are culturally and linguistically responsive, and responding to comments and questions from families that come through on your social media. And this one has an assessment tool also. Outreach is another way to help families find your website, and our new Engaging All Families Strategies for Outreach series will be available soon. You'll find this outreach series and all the other NCPSCE resources on NCPSCE's page on the Child Care Technical Assistance website. Again, please uh, share any questions or comments in chat. Thank you for your interest in consumer education and engagement. And we at NCPSCE would be delighted to hear from you about any of the materials that you use and uh, how you used them and, and how we could make them better. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, we'd like to share with you some other websites that you'll find some great resources on, the Early Childhood Technical Training and Technical Assistance System website, the Consumer Education Resource page, and the SCBC Consumer Education Webinar Series. So the, this will also be included in the slides that uh, will be posted next week. Um, I'd like to ask Violetta to put up a poll so we can hear back from you about the strategies that we've introduced to you and the resources. Thank you, Violetta. If you could just take a minute to let us know about it if your understanding has improved. Thank you for participating in this poll. Here's another poll. How likely are you to be able to use these strategies or resources in your future work? Thank you, Violetta. So we want to remind you about our next webinar two weeks from today, Ask Me Anything. And um, that's an opportunity for us to answer any questions that you have put in the chat box today or some that you are going to send to the Capacity Building Center email. And we'll go deeper into some of these topics um, to respond to what you would like to hear from us. Um, it's two weeks from today, 2 to 3.30, and it looks like someone moved this, sorry. Okay, and our last poll, Violetta. Feel free to enter any other topics that you'd like to hear from in the future. Thank you, Violetta. So before we close today, I wanted to thank our speakers, Karen Ruprecht, Richard Gonzalez, Jim Lesko, Kay Washington, and Jennifer Drake, and remind you of our next series in July. On July 11th from 2 to 3 Eastern Time, we'll be having a webinar to explore the use of tools such as Google Analytics to understand how consumers use your website and social media platforms. 
It's called Using Data to Inform Your Website. You'll learn about how to interpret data and put that information into action to improve the user experience. So we hope you will use this registration link and join us at that time. And then don't forget that two weeks after that, we'll have our Ask Me Anything uh, session to go deeper into any topics or any questions that you had. So thank you today for joining us on our webinar, and we hope to see you in two weeks. Have a great day.